This is a two-part collaboration with the very talented Troubled Dreams. Be sure to stay tuned to the end of the video to follow the link to part two, located on his channel. Enjoy. The Ouija Board Sometimes it seems like a helpful tool, and other times it appears to be a gateway to more troubling and even sinister entities. Here are several true stories from Ouija Board users. Number 1. I never believed in any of this sort of thing until I saw it with my own eyes. In the fall of 1998, my friends and I spoke of doing a Ouija board. Skeptical as I was, I gladly accepted the opportunity. We didn't have a board, and I didn't want to drive forever to look for one, so my friends and I made one. It was a piece of cardboard with the lettering on it. We even put the sun and moon in the top corners. For the indicator, we cut out a triangular piece of cardboard, which had to be moved with force since it didn't slide smoothly like the ones sold at stores. We lived in Huntsville, Texas, and the day we decided to do it, Martin Garul, a prisoner who was on death row for murder and had escaped, had just been found dead in the river not too far from my friend's house. The house was old and decrepit, with a middle room that could have been a second living area, but at the time was being used for a bedroom. Ten of us gathered around the board in that room, the only light coming from a large cake candle we had. Now all night, a couple of my friends were saying, let's talk to Garul. We sat around the board, and Tanner and Melissa were the only ones who were going to touch it. Tanner had never done anything like that, but Melissa claimed to have witnessed how it was done. They put their hands over the indicator, and Tanner asked, Are there any spirits out there tonight? I know it's corny, but that's what somebody said he should say. Then, the indicator moved. Now this was very shocking, because their fingers never actually touched the indicator. Each merely had their index and middle finger hovering two inches above it. As soon as it moved, very slowly I might add, it amazed everyone. The shock made those who were skeptical, like myself, at least curious and quiet. It moved to... Yes. From that moment, I only remember a few of the questions. I remember when Tanner asked, What is your name? It replied, Used to be Garul. At that moment, I said, This isn't how Garul is spelled. I thought it was spelled Garuli. Chad retorted, and said that he had seen it in the papers and it was Garul. Then some weird stuff happened. Tommy was sitting next to me and he nudged me. He said, Did you see that? Before I could answer, Chad said, I saw it. Personally, I did not. But later they said the left side of the indicator picked up off the board and was dragging on the right. I did, though, see this amazing impossibility that made me believe even further. Their fingers were over the T, and the indicator quickly slid over to the A. Their fingers were still over the T on the other side of the board. They just pulled their hands away after they saw that. Now this whole time, I felt claustrophobic and stifled. My chest felt compressed, and there were lumps in my throat. Then we asked the question that verified that it was real. 
Shay was sitting on the bed, about four feet from the board. He said Martin Garul went to high school in the Corpus Christi area, but he didn't know where, as he traveled a lot as a high school FFA officer. He knew most of the schools there. No one else that was there had ever been to Corpus Christi or knew anything about it. Tanner asked Garul where he went to high school. The indicator slid to the R and then to the A, and Shay's eyes watered, and he moved to sit right by the board and said, No way. Then it went to the Y. Shay said, The Ray Texans. It's a school in Corpus. This shocked everyone, and I think they all felt stifled in the same way I did. At this point, Tanner ran into the kitchen and turned on the light. He had goosebumps and his eyes were watering. I remember it as if it were yesterday. He said, I'm not going back in there, Tommy. There was something around me in there. This house belonged to Tommy, so he said, Well, go ask it to leave then, because if there is something in here, I want it to go. After he was coaxed, Tanner went in and asked it to leave. The indicator went to no. He asked it again, and it still replied no. He asked a third time, and it went toward no, then went to the middle of the board and stopped all movement. We would not move again, so we went to the back porch and burned the board while some of us smoked. When we went inside, as soon as the last person entered the kitchen and shut the door, the pots fell off the counter and the pictures under the magnets on the refrigerator fell to the floor. Everyone was silent. Tommy and Shay slept in the other room that night and took the deer heads off the wall. They didn't want them to talk to them in the middle of the night. I understand completely how the mind makes people think they see things they do not. But that night, there was no other explanation. No one in that room knew where Garul went to high school and the only one who knew any schools in that area was sitting away from the board. It could not have just randomly gone to those letters. I got on the internet and found out by the end of that semester that Garou did attend Ray High School. Lots of strange things happened around that house after that night. I spent a lot of time over there and screen doors would swing wide open and shut. The power breaker would flip on and off for no reason. They said the television would turn on and off. I know that it is possible that this could have possibly been explained, but that night was the only time I was absolutely sure that I had witnessed a supernatural phenomenon. Number two. I used to live in a haunted house. In fact, we were in a book called the Pinoco Ghost Book. A huge family was massacred by the Indians, and their souls are still wandering. We had many, many experiences with the children of the family. We started using a Ouija board, and I found a spirit. A little boy who was killed with an axe by a man he thought was his father. A few years later, I decided to use my board again. The spirit located me again and led me to his grave. Interestingly enough, on the gravestone was a carving of a little boy with a man behind him, and behind the man, an Indian with what was probably their version of an axe back then. I believe the Indian killed the boy but the boy thought it was his father. When I reported back to him, he seemed to be at peace with this information, 
and I have never heard from him since. I've communicated with spirits for years, but this was the first interactive type of experience I ever had. Number 3 This happened when I was 9 years old. I spontaneously purchased a Ouija board from the store because it looked like an exciting game. I'd never heard of them before and had no idea what it was. Consequently, I was confused when I brought it home and my mother became very angry when she saw it. Those things are not toys, she said. In fact, God forbids using them because they're considered a tool for sorcerers and black magic. I was raised in a very religious family. She didn't take it away from me, but I was scared to use it. A few months later though, during summer vacation, my sister and I decided to take it out and give it a try. The usual thing happened. Nothing. My sister, who was four years older, then decided to try and contact my dead grandmother, Dorothy, called Dot, who died before I was born. We asked for our grandma, and the board spelled out, Hello, girls. Now before I continue, it's important to understand how we were positioned in the living room my sister was sitting on the couch, and I was sitting on the edge of the coffee table. The board was between us on a large footstool. We'd been watching movies earlier in that day, and there was an orange plastic bowl of leftover popcorn on the other side of the room on the floor. My back was to the bowl, but my sister could see it clearly. Anyway, I was about to ask Grandma a question when my sister took her hands off the planchette and screamed. She cried, Oh my God! and pointed over my shoulder. I turned around to see the bowl of popcorn hovering about two feet off the ground. For some reason, I was really mad. I knew it wasn't our grandma, but something else. The planchette was skidding across the board wildly with my hands still on it, so I took my hands off it and cried, Knock it off! The bowl flipped over and fell to the ground as popcorn scattered everywhere. The planchette stopped skidding and flipped itself over. I believed mom's warnings after that. My sister was so scared that she refused to ever touch a Ouija board again. I broke the board in two and threw it away right then and there. It was a little too weird for the both of us. i played with Ouija boards since then, but nothing as strange as that has ever happened again. Number 4 A friend had a blind dinner date at a guy's apartment and was afraid to go alone, so she roped me into coming along and being set up with his roomie. After dinner, they wanted to play with their Ouija. I refused. It was exactly nine months from the day my father had died and I was feeling pretty out of it. I was wearing jewelry he'd given me, as well as one of his t-shirts and one of his sweaters to feel closer to him. The room was dark, and I began to feel as if the oxygen was leaving the room. They asked the Ouija who it wanted to speak to, and it began to spell out my childhood nickname. Cheryl didn't know it because she was a fairly new friend. She'd never even known my dad. I made a noise and said, no, then told Cheryl I wanted to leave right then and there. They asked who it was, 
and it spelt my father's name. And again, no one there knew it. I got upset and said I knew it was lying. The candles blew out, and Cheryl screamed because she said she could not move her hands off of the pointer, and neither could the boys. They were dumbfounded. I began to be choked by an invisible entity, and I was writhing on the floor and calling for my dad to help me. Meanwhile, our friend had been sent to pick us up at 8 p.m. for us to go out with him. He heard us screaming. He came in, and everything seemed to rush out of the room. He dragged me out and locked me in the car, and then went back in for Cheryl. We never spoke of it again. The guys tried to call us and apologize and get us to talk about the incident. We told them to leave us alone. Number 5. At age 7, I bought my first Ouija board. I have always liked horror, and when my mom told me that that game is where you talk to the dead, I couldn't resist. So I had played at my friend Ryan's house a lot when I was 8 and he was 7. We always played when it was dark. We had talked to a bunch of people, but each of us thought it was the other person moving it. One time we played and got someone named Amanda. She said that she could come out. We didn't understand, so we stopped playing. Ryan started feeling cold and said he felt someone breathe on his neck. Later that same day, Amanda must have been around my house. No one was home. My sister was at dance. My mom had gone to pick her up and my dad had gone to my uncle's house. Nothing was happening. Ryan and I just sat on my bed in the basement, counting some fake money we had stolen from my sister. All of a sudden we felt a breeze. We both looked at each other. Then the dream catcher above my bed began to move. No air conditioning was on then. Nothing but silence in the house. Ryan and I got up and ran upstairs to the family room. There was a big light hanging from the ceiling and a mirror to our left. I went over to turn on the stereo to my right when I felt something move. I turned around and looked at Ryan, who had been behind me. We both looked up, and the light was shaking. We both screamed and ran up to the third floor to Michelle's, my sister's, room. She had a radio. Ryan sat on her bed, and when I turned it on, everything on the shelf began to shake. We ran to my parents' room and called our parents. And fortunately, nothing ever happened again. Number 6 I feel very strange telling you this, but this was an incident that happened two years ago and still leaves me perplexed. My best friend and I had been using a Ouija for four years before this happened. We usually contacted the same spirits who claimed that they had been our soulmates in many lives. Because of this, they tended to get a little overprotective, moody, and act like typical guys when it comes to real men in my life. Usually, they would claim that if I liked a guy, it was because he was an incarnate of one of them. But with one particular boyfriend, the spirits had a big problem. On many occasions, Ervim, the most protective of the spirits, told me I had to break up with my boyfriend, that he was a demonic sort of spirit that would do eternal harm to mine. 
I ignored Evim, saying that I couldn't break off a perfectly good relationship based on the jealousy of a spirit. But Evim persisted. One day, he asked me to look at my drawing pad. I looked and found that one page in my new book had become wet and had dried, leaving behind traces of a yellowish substance. Upon tracing lines around the yellow impressions, I realized he had left me a note written in the angelic alphabet, as seen in Buckland's book. I went home and translated the alphabet, and it read, Beware of bats. That phrase meant nothing to my best friend, but it did mean something to me. My boyfriend, the very one Ervim was warning me about, was an avid collector of bat paraphernalia, and even had a bat tattooed on his back. The really creepy thing about all this is that I finally did break up with my boyfriend because he told me that he believed he was a fallen angel and that he could produce an ethereal alter ego to avenge his sorrows. The point is that my boyfriend did turn out to be psychotic, if not demonic, and Ervim had given me the physical proof to believe so. No one but myself, in my immediate circle, is familiar with the angelic alphabet. No one knew about the bats. No one had a chance to draw in my art book. And with what? Number 7 I have been fascinated with the Ouija board as early as the age of 10. I distinctly remember when I was 13 years old while my mom was at work. I invited a couple of friends over and there were five of us. When we tried to play the Ouija, the planchette would not move. When one boy named Jose gave up, he removed himself and we proceeded to ask questions. Amazingly enough, the planchette started to move. It spelled out his name in the word holy. Being very daring and dumb, we asked it to prove that it was with us. We asked it to do something. A few questions later, we heard a weird voice. We all got creeped out and got quiet. Jose had turned on a cassette of mixes and jams and was playing it quietly in the dining room. Then we all heard this monstrous voice on the tape say my name. Margie. It was a slow, deep, horrible voice, and we all screamed and ran outside. Since then, I will never play the Ouija. We all heard that evil voice, and it was not imagined. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to subscribe and continue on to part 2 found on Troubled Dreams channel by clicking on the on-screen link or in the description below and unravel the mysteries of the Ouija.